Hello, and welcome to Building APIs with gRPC and PHP, uh, and a little bit of Golang. All right, so this is really more um, also gRPC for dummies. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, when I started working on my current company about two and a half years ago, uh, all of the backend team was really big into this technology called gRPC. And me as a, as a newbie developer, I didn't really know what it was and I kind of had a hard time trying to understand all of the differences and exactly how it all worked. Uh, but once I was able to really understand how all the pieces fit together, I became really excited about this technology because it really helps you create APIs pretty quickly. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, kind of like how to build a API with gRPC. Um, also, hi, my name is Ceci Korea. Uh, and I'm a software engineer at Context.io. And I work on a publicly available API that essentially is an abstraction on top of email. So our API typically deals with millions of messages uh, that we process every month for millions of users. So it's very uh, big data driven. Um, so what is gRPC and why do we use it? So gRPC stands for uh, gRPC Remote Procedure Calls. So it's one of those um, recursive acronyms like YAML. A lot of people think that YAML is uh, yet another markup language, but actually YAML is YAML ain't markup language. So it's one of those, again, recursive acronyms where they're trying to be funny. Um, so okay, uh, gRPC stands for gRPC Remote Procedure Calls. Uh, so what, what does that mean? Uh, what is RPC? Uh, so RPC, again, it's a remote procedure call, and the best way that I could try to find to explain what that is, uh, is just data exchange between two processes. Uh, so you take data from one place and you push it somewhere else. Um, so it's like an API. Uh, so yes, yes, it's an API. Uh, it's a different way of building an API. So given that we have something like REST, which has been a standard for API development for years and it's served us well, uh, why would we want to go with RPC over REST? What's the deal with RPC versus REST? Which one should you use? What are the differences? Um, so I, I was trying to find, again, a good example of how to explain that. I found a great article from Smashing Magazine uh, where they talk about this difference. So um, the RPC part stands for Remote Procedure Call, uh, and it's essentially the same as calling a function in JavaScript, PHP, or Python, and so on. Uh, it takes a method name and arguments. So it's just a different way of making a call. Um, another way that I see it described is a more native way of making a call. And I think with native, what, they're, what they mean is that you use um, you're using that language uh, that you already know um, to make the calls. So RPC, good for actions, uh, and REST, good for things like CRUD, uh, create, read, update, delete, uh, and modeling your domain. Those are things that you can't do with RPC, because uh, RPC is a little bit more loosey-goosey. It doesn't have those conventions that REST does. So for example, in a REST endpoint, you would have something like say, get users, an ID for that user, uh, photos, and then a photo ID, and that's how you would locate a specific resource uh, with a REST API. And just looking at that endpoint, then you're able to gather a lot of data just from that function. So you can see this is something for users, you have an ID, helps you find that user, you know that user's gonna have photos, and by having an ID, you know you're gonna get a specific ID. So again, there's a lot of information that REST can base within that convention. And with RPC, you don't have those conventions. So if you wanted to make a call to get photos, you might do something like get user photos, which would be a function. It would take arguments and it would return you some data. Uh, and what that data is would be up to you. So why gRPC specifically? Um, 
first of all, gRPC was sort of developed internally by Google is what they use uh, internally for pretty much all of their services, and they went ahead and open sourced that. Uh, so it, I suspect that it's called gRPC because of Google, but they don't really want to say it. Uh, that's why they have a cutesy name. Um, so why gRPC? It uses HTTP2. It's language agnostic, so you can actually use a gRPC service with pretty much any major language. So PHP, of course, uh, you can use it with JavaScript, Ruby, Python, C Sharp, uh, you name it. Uh, it's also highly efficient and very scalable, again, because it's using that HTTP2. Uh, so it's really good for handling large uh, amounts of data. So for um, my current job with the API that we work on, where we're moving millions of messages uh, a month, uh, we really needed a way to be able to move large amounts of data fairly quickly, and it's really helped us achieve that. So what about HTTP2? Um, so why is HTTP2 faster than, say, HTTP1? So HTTP2 is binary, so it's a more sort of like native way for computers to talk to each other and exchange data. So as a result, you are able to put in more data in those requests. Therefore, it's a little bit more efficient at moving large amounts of data. Uh, it's also multiplexed, so you can move multiple files at a time. You don't have to do one file at a time. Uh, and it also shares the same connection, so you don't have to do one connection per request. Uh, you can open one connection, do your work, close the connection. Um, so again, trying to look in the internet for a good way to try to like exemplify this, this is the best way that I could come up with. Uh, and it's something that I actually found on CSS Tricks. Uh, so this is sort of like the difference between HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. As you can see, on the left, you would have like, you know, each request this one thing, whereas in HTTP 2, you can just get the whole thing at once. So that's kind of like the difference. And that's why HTTP 2 tends to be faster. Um, so it's really cool that if you're using gRPC right now, you can start using HTTP 2 today. So who is using gRPC? Obviously Google, because <laughs> they kind of developed it. They've open sourced it, uh, so you can contribute to it. Uh, companies like Niantic, who make Pokemon Go, also use gRPC. And I believe Niantic used to be an offshoot of Google, so that's kind of where that... Um, um, sort of like relationship comes from. Netflix uses it a lot as well uh, for a lot of their internal services. Docker, Square, CoreOS, and even Twitch. Uh, they don't use gRPC, however, they, they use RPC, but they develop their own version of RPC called Twerp, uh, and it's also open source on GitHub, you can use it. So, yes, Pokemon Go is an example of a pretty big application that is using this right now on production. Um, and what they do is that they use a combination of gRPC and another technology called protocol buffers or protobuffs. And uh, combined, this is how you are able to make an API and have a server and client exchange those messages. So when I first started trying to develop APIs with gRPC and protocol buffers, I had a hard time trying to figure out the difference between gRPC and protobuf. I kind of thought that they were almost interchangeable and I didn't really know where to start. So this is essentially the difference between the two. So gRPC is sort of like the protocol and protobufs is how you define the service and the actual messages are going to be exchanged uh, between the client and the server. Um, so let's get started uh, and try to figure out how all this fits together. Uh, so what you're going to need. First of all, you're going to need uh, protobufs to define your service. You're then going to need uh, a tool called protoc to generate client and server stubs uh, based on that service definition. So with protocol buffers, you're essentially going to write, hey, this is what this API should look like. And uh, based on that definition, Proto-C is going to generate libraries for pretty much any language you want. So if you want to generate a library in PHP, Ruby, JavaScript, you can do pretty much all of that at once in just a few seconds. And once you generate those uh, client stubs, uh, you would then need a gRPC server to handle those requests. So to get all of the things installed, uh, unfortunately, um, I only know how to install it on Mac because I'm a Mac person uh, and 
Luckily though, if you are on a Mac, it's pretty easy. You just pretty much brew install all the things. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to do. Uh, I write the gRPC server in Go, so I also install Golang. Uh, but you can write the gRPC server pretty much in any language, except for PHP, because right now gRPC does not allow you to write uh, or to have a PHP gRPC server. Uh, however, it looks like twerp does. Uh, so I'm not familiar with twerp, but that's something that if you were interested in running a um, server, in, a PHP gRPC server, you might want to look into that. So for now, I just have to write the server in something else. Uh, so I chose to write it in Golang. Uh, and for other instructions, pretty much like for any other type of system, you can go to grpc.io and you can see alternatives for how to install everything you need uh, for the type of machine that you have, or the, for your OS, rather. Okay, so that's it. We're done. You installed everything. That's it. Uh, no. <laughs> so step one is to create a proto file. So this is where you're going to define what your API looks like. So it's actually pretty easy. Uh, to try to figure out how to write that. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of documentation online if you just uh, go uh, to Google uh, documentation. Uh, protocol buffers, that's something that, um, again, Google makes available. Um, so they have a lot of documentation on their site on exactly how to write all of this stuff. So this is essentially your API. You're defining um, the name of the service. Um, at the top, you would say, what the name of the package is and then what the name of the service. And right here, um, so I'm writing an API called dad joke uh, and it gives you a dad joke whenever you make a request to the API. So that's kind of what I'm using as a demo today. Uh, so the name of my service is dad joke. Uh, and under this service, you would see it says RPC and then it says sort of like what the call is. So here I'm going to make, um, it's going to be called get dad joke and it's going to take a dad joke request and it's gonna return a dad joke response. And what this means is that the request and the response are both messages and you would define what those messages look like right below. And when you define those messages, that's what the client and the server is going to exchange. So you're not exchanging JSON, you're, ex you're exchanging a proto buff uh, message. So what does this kind of look like? Uh, it is base 64 encoded whenever it goes from the client to the server. So it looks like gobbledygook. Um, but once you decode that, then it looks like this. Uh, and these two are actual messages generated from Pokemon Go. So uh, there's a great article called Reverse Engineering Pokemon Go. Uh, and it guides you through how you can uh, take one of the messages and decode it and kind of figure out what is being said. And a lot of people used that um, to sort of figure out how to build uh, services on top of Pokemon Go. So a lot of the people that were uh, writing stuff to like figure out where a certain um, Pokemon was, uh, they were sort of like reverse engineering the protobuf to be able to um, kind of like figure out how to work with that API. So. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I think that after, um, and this was very early on after the release of Pokemon Go, so I think that they've, I think they've curbed all of that by now, but um, I thought it was very interesting that if you kind of know how to do all this, um, you would be able to um, sort of like read the messages. So again, this is an example message from Pokemon Go. So this would be the uh, encoded unencoded but even once you unencode it it still looks like I, what what is this one two three some long integer like you don't know how to read this um, that's what your protofile does so if you look at all the numbers like it'll say like okay the joke request string keyword is number one so this is kind of how your service knows how to decode this so what people did when they reverse engineered Pokemon Go is that even though they didn't have, this is the key, they didn't have this key, but with enough of these messages, they were able to figure out what the key was or they got very close to that. Um, oops, they were able to figure out what the key was and they got very close to that. <laughs> so 
the thought behind this is that the client and the server are going to be exchanging these messages and the client and the server have the key and they're able to figure out what the message is. Um, so one way that we use gRPC where we don't have to sort of um, worry so much about someone intercepting the message is that we use it internally for microservices. So all of these microservices are running internally for us uh, in a Kubernetes cluster in a VPC and they only talk to other services within our, our cluster that are specifically authorized to like look at and or like listen at a certain port so like everything like that is very close. Um, so that's how we run it internally. I have no idea how a company like Niantic is able to run this uh, publicly. Um, yeah, like I think that authentication is something that in our company we haven't quite figured out. Uh, so it's still kind of like a mystery to me. So personally, I really like to use it uh, for internal microservices. That was a rant. Okay, so once you have your uh, protobuf definition, um, you would then use this uh, to create client stuffs and server stuffs. So this is how you're going to start writing uh, your actual service. So step two is to create these stuffs, the, your server and your client stuffs. Uh, it's actually pretty easy. So earlier I said you would need to install something called proto C, and then you just write out this command in your command line, and this spits out a PHP library that you can then use uh, to integrate the API into whatever it is that you might have. Um, so you can take this library and just integrate it into an ex existing service. Um, so what does this command look like? It's actually pretty long, uh, but if you actually look at it line by line, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out what's happening. So here you're just calling proto C, uh, dash I proto is where your file is located. So in this case, it's a directory. I then specify what language I want out. So here, instead of lang, I put PHP out and then dir the directory where I want the library to be spit out. Uh, I then use gRPC out, and this also tells uh, Proto C where to put uh, the gRPC files to create uh, my server stub. Uh, and then after this, I have to specify where my PHP uh, plugin is for gRPC. So we just say which gRPC plugin, and then that gives you uh, the location. Uh, and then after this, you just point this to where your Proto file is. Uh, I'll show you kind of what this looks like a little bit later in the command line. So a typical uh, sort of project structure might look something like this once you've generated your library. So you would probably have a file where you keep your proto definition for your service. Uh, you might want to put that in its own folder. Uh, you would have maybe a place where you keep all of your client files. Uh, maybe a different uh, folder for all your server stuff. Uh, you might also even have a different folder yet uh, for all the different client stuff that you can have. So if you wanted to have uh, different libraries for your service in Ruby and Python or pretty much any other language, JavaScript, uh, whatever language gRPC supports, which they pretty much support every major language, uh, you could have just you know a whole folder full of different libraries for pretty much any language so that say if you were running this internally at a company and there was another uh, internal team that you wanted them to integrate with your service, you could ask them, hey, you know, what, what do you guys need? And they could tell you, oh, well, this service is written in Node. So then you could just be like, hey, here you go. Here's the Node library. And it can be that easy for another uh, internal team within your company to uh, integrate um, your service into an existing um, system within the company. So step three would be to create a gRPC server. So again, right now gRPC doesn't support um, service written in PHP, so I wrote it in Go. And it's actually not very hard at all. You're, all you're doing here is just creating a server that is listening on port 50051, which is sort of like the uh, port for gRPC. Um, and in here for my dad joke service, I just cre created a placeholder joke. Uh, so that's what you see at the top there. Um, and then all you do is implement um, the service that you specified earlier. So if you 
compare the uh, proto file that I showed you earlier that defines the API, you can see that we're saying, okay, we have an RPC, it's called get dad joke, and it takes a dad joke request and it uh, returns a dad joke response under service dad joke. So that's pretty much all you need to know for your server. And the way that you would write that in your server, again, you're pretty much just taking what's in your proto file and what you, de uh, what you define there, and you're turning that into a function on your server um, that takes that request and uh, responds with that predefined response. Um, and then it also returns an error. Uh, I'm gonna actually show you all of the code um, so that this hopefully can make a little bit more sense. Uh, and then after this, you just open up that server and you're listening and that's pretty much it. Um, once you have your server, then you're gonna wanna write some clients for your server. Um, so first, uh, we can write a client in PHP and these are all uh, functions that we get from the generated uh, PHP library. So here you can see I just start up a new client, uh, dad, joke, dad joke client, I tell it where uh, it needs to connect, so I'm pointing it to localhost 5000, sorry, 50051, which is where my server is. Um, right now I'm using insecure credentials just because this is an example, uh, but if you need the credentials, you would pass the credentials right there, uh, and then after that you just create a new request, uh, send it over, wait for a response. Once you get the response, then you can print that joke. So rest, get joke. And for the sake of the example, I also created, um, oh, before I get to that, uh, in order to get gRPC uh, running happily uh, in PHP, you do have to compose or install gRPC as a dependency in your project. And you're also gonna need to peckle install gRPC and protobuf. Uh, they actually have really good uh, steps on everything that you need to download specifically for getting this to work in PHP uh, over at the grpc.io docs. Okay, so for the sake of the example, I also wrote a client in Ruby to kind of show you that it's pretty simple and how, how it works working with those generated libraries. So here again, I'm just creating um, a new client, I'm telling it where it needs to go and make the request, so again, it's at local host and at that port, insecure credentials, and then I just make the request, and then I just make a call to rest.joke, and that brings me back uh, the response. So this is all just leveraging uh, the generated code from the libraries. So let's actually see what this looks like. There we go. Can make it a little bit bigger. Hopefully that's good. So here you can see um, sort of uh, my uh, structure. So I have this proto file here, and this is what I showed you earlier. This defines your service, and this defines the messages that are gonna be passed uh, back and forth. Okay, that's much better. So this is what is gonna spit out the libraries that I keep referring to, and this is what they look like. So here, let's look at the uh, generated libraries for Ruby. Uh, just because these are two files, I'll show you what the PHP looks like in a second. Um, so here you can see, it'll say generated by protocol buffer compiler, so you never want to edit these generated files. Um, so that's why it'll have um, something at the top like comment to tell you hey these are generated files don't mess with them um, so here you can see that it pretty much um, creates everything that you need to do to make a call to the service so once you look at here and you look at this other um, file you can see the shape of the service and Looking at this, you pull in this library into a client that you write. Again, you pull it up here, you just require it. Um, 
Okay, that's much better. Uh, and then here, you're literally just making, you're pulling in that library and using those files to make calls. Um, so it makes it super easy once you have those generated libraries to go and make a call to a service. Again, it's just a few lines of code. Uh, let me actually show you what this looks like in PHP. I also find it really interesting to see the differences between uh, the libraries that are generated. So for Ruby, it just generated me two files. Um, and for PHP, it definitely did a lot more. Um, so here you can see, where did I put it? Okay, here. So I have this uh, dad joke stuff and it creates um, pretty much everything that I need. So it creates the client, it creates uh, the request, and you can see here it pretty much sets um, over here. Uh, it creates uh, getters and setters for everything. Uh, it creates your constructor. So again, it like it does a lot of stuff for you so you can start making calls towards that API. Um, so here is where you get the resource, <laughs> set the resource. Um, so again, it like gives you everything you need to make that call. So these are the generated libraries. And then here, I'm gonna show you the actual PHP uh, again, uh, so you can see how easy it is. I just um, put those libraries into my uh, auto load um, and I'm sort of vendoring them with Composer. Um, so I can also show you what that looks like. I uh, added a gRPC and protobuf under my requirements and then I just auto load the lib directory. So then now when I look at uh, the client that I wrote, I, you can see like I'm using those, uh, those um, functions from that generated library. So I just create a new client, no credentials, et cetera, and then I print out the joke. Um, so to actually see what this looks like, uh, I'm gonna start up my server. It's gonna take a little bit to get started. There we go. And I put in an emoji there because I like emojis. Uh, and then maybe I can make this a little bit bigger because it's super small. And then over here, make this a little bit bigger. Um, let me go into my PHP directory and show you that example. So this just makes a call. Uh, and I'm just printing out uh, the joke that I got back from the service. Uh, and then just for the sake of the example, so you can see that it is language agnostic and that you can use all the different libraries to make the same call and get the same data back. Uh, I'm gonna go into the other uh, Ruby example that I created uh, and run that. And it makes the call, gets that same joke back. Um, so they're both hitting uh, this service. Um, I had, if I had better logging, I could probably have added some log lines so that you could see that it's handling the requests. Um, but what I think is really neat about this approach is that you can uh, generate a service, spit out those libraries, and you can have anybody uh, interface with this in the language of their choice, and you don't have to write a wrapper for that. So that's really helped us internally be able to support a lot of different um, teams. Uh, we just essentially, we have our service, we create libraries, we put all the libraries in an internal repo and different teams can go and download the libraries that they need uh, so that they can consume um, our service into whatever that they need. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, and I wanted to give you sort of like a real world example of how we've been using this to um, essentially modernize our API. So as I said earlier, I work for a company called Context.io, which is a um, public API that developers can use to interface with email and to e integrate email into an existing application. Uh, so this is kind of what our uh, API console looks like. Uh, and I took a screenshot of it just so that I can kind of show you visually 
what the API looks like. Um, so you can kind of see like, you know, all of the different endpoints that we have, all of the resources, um, and that's kind of what we have. We actually have two versions of an API. We have an older version called 2.0, and then we have an, a, a newer, more lightweight version called Lite. So we're supporting uh, an API that is about 10 years old, uh, that became a huge monolith, and we're supporting two versions of that. So working on that became really difficult um, because again, it was it, we were dealing with legacy code, and it was really hard to try to develop new features on top of it. Um, so we definitely had some pretty big pain points. Again, the code base is about ten years old. It's a big monolith. It's also very heavily coupled, uh, so it's been hard to unit test. So we've had uh, issues where you know if we add something else, if we add a new feature, we can't really unit test it because the way that uh, initially the API was created, it was really, really coupled, so that made it hard to even start adding unit tests. Um, so as a result, we've also had um, problems scaling up. So we needed a way to start modernizing the code base, but at the same time, we have developers using our API every day, so how can we do this in a way that's not disruptive uh, for the developers that are using our API? So the way that we did it was by using gRPC, uh, to essentially start uh, eating away at the problem. So we replaced small pieces of functionality from our API with microservices uh, that use gRPC and protobuf uh, to define the service. Mm -hmm. And we did this uh, essentially tacking one resource at a time. So for example, in our API, we have a, an endpoint called discovery. Uh, it doesn't get requests you pass in an email, and then it returns uh, IMAP server discovery settings. Uh, so that was one resource that only had uh, one method, uh, so we turned that into its own gRPC service. And then after that, we started uh, using a different resource, so we have one um, endpoint that gives you contacts for a user, and that became the contact service. Uh, we have another uh, resource within the API that deals with webhooks, so we turn that into its own service. Uh, we also have messages and folders, and again, each one of those became their own service. And this whole process is actually a, a, um, sort of like eating away at the API and taking one resource and putting a microservice behind it um, <coughs> has been about two and a half years in the making. So. It's not always possible um, to just start tearing stuff down when you have a, a legacy code base and then also a lot of developers that use your service that don't want disruption. Mm -hmm. And then you also have business priorities. So you might not be all hands on deck modernizing uh, different endpoints and writing different services. Um, so we've been able to get around that by saying, okay, we might, we might be able to sneak in one service um, this quarter, maybe next quarter, we don't really get to work on another service, uh, but two quarters from now, we will. So th that's been able to help us sort of like more easily eat away at the problem to now where we, when we started trying to modernize our API, we had one monolith, but then by doing it in little pieces, uh, we've been able to um, turn a lot more resources into their own microservices, again, because we've been doing it sort of like slowly whenever we do have time um, and without disrupting uh, our end users. So what ended up happening to our PHP monolith API uh, was that it became a front end uh, to this back end of microservices. Uh, and we still have other areas of the uh, PHP that we haven't quite uh, gotten to replace with a microservice, uh, but again, going from pretty much everything in a monolith that was tightly coupled to microservices that are actually, uh, each one is tested and each one is sort of like its own thing, uh, has make, made it a lot easier uh, to uh, work with the API and be able to modernize it and scale it up. Uh, another huge advantage from this approach for us is that we can now generate client libraries uh, and docs. So a pain point that we have supporting a public API is that we need to write client libraries for our developers to use. However, we're a small team and not everybody knows every language 
uh, in our team. So a lot of the times we get um, developers who ask for uh, client libraries and languages that we don't know. So for example, um, nobody in our team really knows Swift, nobody in our team really knows C Sharp, uh, and we have a lot of requests from different developers who want to use our API for these libraries. And because we don't have anybody with that domain knowledge, we're not able to create those libraries. But with gRPC, um, in the future, once our whole API is running on a gRPC sort of like backed microservices, uh, then we would be able to generate libraries for pretty much any language. And what this achieves too is feature parity between our API and the client libraries. So a lot of times when you have an API uh, and you make a change, you forget to change the client library or the wrapper, and then someone realizes it and they send you a support ticket and they're like, hey, uh, I tried to do this and it doesn't work anymore. Oh yeah, because we changed that and we forgot to change the client library. So whenever you're using gRPC uh, and you make a change to your API, that causes you to generate new libraries. So then that means that it's a lot easier to have that feature parity uh, between uh, your API and the libraries that you have. This also means that you can have feature parity between your API and your docs. Uh, because there is also a way that you can generate documentation based on your protocol uh, buffer definitions. Uh, depending on how you annotate, uh, you can spit out docs as well. So then that means that if you make a change to your API, you can spit out new docs and always be in this state of uh, parity. So this is sort of like the brave new future that we're trying to move towards. Um, and then other uh, other things that we've seen as benefits of this approach is, again, if there's someone in the team that doesn't know a certain language, it's okay, we can just generate um, a library for that language and be pretty sure that it's gonna be, um, that it's gonna be good. Uh, we haven't run into any issues with a generated library that doesn't work in whatever language we've uh, made it in. Um, and then it's also pretty easy for other teams to consume your service. We've actually even had, um, uh, situations where uh, we're working directly with another developer and we just have given them a client library and then also uh, docs generated from our gRPC definitions and we just turn that into a client they're working uh, in a completely different company and they're able to just take that and run with it and it's been really great for us because then we're we're just able to focus on actually doing the work we give them the files uh, to libraries and the docs and they're up and running. So that's been really nice for us. So lastly, gRPC can also generate REST stubs. Uh, so earlier I was talking about how, well, you know, what's the difference between like gRPC or RPC and REST, why you would want to use each one. Uh, so one thing that we're running into now is that as we move to an API that is completely backed by gRPC, obviously not everybody might want to consume the API via a library. We might have people who still want to use the REST endpoints, so how do we support them? Uh, and luckily, gRPC can also generate an HTTP gateway, uh, and it'll also generate uh, those endpoints for you if you want them. So you can go from gRPC to generate it, uh, generating a REST uh, endpoints and gateway, and then that is actually a proxy that goes back to gRPC. So it's like, um, it's pretty easy. Uh, there's a, a plugin called gRPC Gateway. It's on GitHub, and you would just download that. You annotate uh, your proto definition. As you can see right there, um, under the RPC call, you would say like, is it a post request? What body does it take? Um, and then gRPC takes these annotations and then turns that into an HTTP endpoint. Um, so then once you do that, you stub out the gateway. So you would get uh, a gateway file like that. And then you could, in, in this specific example, the gateway is in Go because that's what I was using um, for my gRPC server. Uh, and then you would just write a proxy server that literally just takes um, the HTTP stuff and then just redirects it to gRPC and then gets it and then sends it right back. Um, so again, it's like you can go full circle with, uh, with all of this, but I think that um, once you get to that point, um, I don't know, it's, uh, it's 
pretty pretty impressive um, so if you want to take a look uh, a little bit more and play with this uh, I've made all of this code available uh, in, on github uh, and also I'll tweet it out uh, and I'll use hashtag Texas camp so that it's easy to find if you need to go and just kind of like poke around at all of this because I know that it's a lot of information uh, I know that when I first started uh, working with gRPC it didn't quite all click at once so uh, I would definitely recommend you uh, take a look and play with it uh, and then I would say uh, for questions uh, I prefer uh, talking one-on-one -on -one with folks so if you have any questions uh, let's definitely talk uh, out here um, in the hall or you can also ping me uh, um, at Sessie Korea on Twitter and I'm happy to answer any questions thank you